Welcome to the Modern People Leader, Christy. It's Friday. We made it, and we're so happy to have you. How you doing? Good. I'm I'm so happy to be here, and I'm also so happy it's Friday. It really does feel like you make it some weeks, doesn't it? It really does. And yesterday was one of those days where I had like five back-to-back -back meetings, which aren't usually my favorite days. And today, this is my sole meeting, and there's no other type of meeting that could top doing these recordings. So I'm happy we're here. That makes me feel extra special today. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> All right, so let's do good news stories where we all share, you know, a story from the last week or two that could be work related, could be personal. And Christy, how about how about you get us started? Sure. I actually have something extra special this week because um I was really excited that our CEO Amon Patani just joined over 2400 other CEOs in signing the CEO Action for Diversity and Inclusion pledge. I'm not sure if either of you have heard of it but it's a really wonderful kind of free commitment to our diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging principles and priorities. And it's just, it's a nice way to, to inject some, some early spring energy into all the work that we're doing and, and kind of reaffirm where we're going. So that's my good news for this past week. That's some great news. And nice. I'll go, I'll go next, Stephen, just to buy you some time. <laughs> so my good news is that today is my nephew, William's second birthday. And, uh, yeah, I, I miss the little guy. I haven't seen him in probably like six months because my older brother lives in Dallas and I'm in Austin and it's harder for them to travel these days, but I should be getting to see him soon. And I feel like every time I see him, he's like a different person. So um, yeah, happy birthday, William. Happy birthday, William. Happy birthday, William. Two years. Jeez, time flies. I know. These post-COVID years, it's just such a... Uh... It's such a, it's mind bending because it, really it does not seem like it's been this, this long. Well, my good news, I'm going to, I'm going to be not lame, but it's like obvious and we already kind of talked about it, but EGIF, it has been, this has been a very, very difficult week for me. You know, everything's okay. Everyone's, everything's fine. We've got Transform next week and we have some really exciting things lined up for the Modern People Leader while we're there. But yeah, I my my main good news is that it's Friday and that we're we're almost done with the week. So there you go. I feel that, Stephen. Yeah, me too. <laughs> All right. So so Christy, give us so Stephen likes to call this the Brene Brown question. Give us your story. What what does your journey look like? And and how did that, you know, lead you to becoming the now vice president of diversity, inclusion, and belonging at GoDaddy? Sure. If you're ready to come on uh, the journey with me, I'm going to take oh, you on ready. a bit of one because it's, Let's it's not Let's so go. direct. <laughs> well, I think one of the, the lovely aspects of this work is that all of us find our way here in very different ways, right? Um, some people are coming from HR, some people are coming from you know product backgrounds, et cetera. Mine, mine has a little bit of just about everything. It all I'd say it started out when I was younger, and I, I really am somebody who's so passionate about learning. And as I was getting older and, and going through my studies, I realized how much we learn from each other as well as we're, while we're learning from the books that we're reading, right? So there's general learning through education, but then the learnings from each other when we were actually connecting and engaging with each other. And that really kind of sparked this desire to focus on both social justice, but through the lens of education, because it felt to me like that was the way to truly make an impact in the world. So over time... I spent some time doing some studies around different social justice topics and getting involved in different groups and organizations. And when I was getting to the point of having to choose a career, I, I realized that I wanted to make an impact, but I also needed to learn more about business because I was coming from a background and a family who we didn't have a whole lot of folks in my family who had been in corporate jobs before, right? So I didn't exactly know how I could make an impact in our world, knowing that businesses and corporations play a large role in that. So instead of going into something like getting my PhD and becoming a professor, I actually, what I call, the, I took the, the back door route and, and went into education publishing. So I got to work with some premier academics and really keep my, my interest in on those topics and, and engaged in those topics. But I was also getting to learn how businesses operated and, and how we made products and, and how we marketed to customers and all those, all those really interesting topics that I just hadn't had a whole lot of exposure to. As I was 
in ed ed the education business, obviously the we started shifting more to education technologies, right? So over the, over time, I, I shifted from working on things like people and process transformations, and working on the content, working on mergers and acquisitions, working on strategy and operations, to then focusing on things like technology transformations and how we were actually building the the products to to make it out to market. At the same time, as you can imagine, you're like, where does the DIV stuff come into this, right? I started working on a lot of the cultural transformations in the organizations that I was in. So I had co-founded the first employee resource group at a place that I was. And I started working on a lot of what I would call DEIB programming just off the side of my desk, quote unquote, right? It wasn't part of my day job, but I was passionate and I have a strategy and operations background. So I was able to start partnering with a, a lot of folks who could help make progress there. And right at the time where I planned a more formal move into that work, uh, the business that I was at opened up a role for it. So I threw my hat in the ring and I got it. I was really excited. And then when GoDaddy came along, I got really excited by GoDaddy's focus on making opportunity more inclusive for all specifically, right? Because I was looking for how can I continually make my, my impact bigger and bigger in the world, right? And just have broaden that reach of that impact. And I knew GoDaddy would give me that opportunity because of the, the way that they're actually focusing on small business owners and entrepreneurs and the kind of social impact that that could have. So it all started out with me wanting to really focus on learning and engaging with people, moving into strategy and operations and working on all kinds of technology transformations, focusing on cultural transformations all at the same time, and then bringing that all together into essentially where I am now as the vice president of diversity, inclusion and belonging at GoDaddy. It's funny, sometimes when I tell people that I have an HR podcast, they're like, an HR podcast? Like, why? That's so random. And it all started from this, uh, I guess, curiosity about the HR and HR tech space. And at the beginning, I was like, oh, maybe like I want to start an HR tech company, but like, I don't want to do that yet. How can I just learn from people? And that's why we started. That was one of the reasons we started the podcast. So it sounds like in, in your journey, uh, you know, a big piece of it throughout has been just wanting to continue learning and that led you to where you're at today. So that's a really cool journey. So I feel like most people probably have some familiarity with GoDaddy, but you know, if if you're talking to, you know, your grandma or your grandpa and they're like, hey, what does GoDaddy do? Like what's the what's the quick explanation to them? Yeah, what's the elevator pitch, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I would describe it as GoDaddy is a place where people come to launch and manage their businesses. And our mission is to give entrepreneurs the right tools, resources, insights, and support to transform their ideas into success. So essentially, folks are coming to us when they're ready to finalize their idea, build a professional website, attract customers, uh, sell their products and services, and actually manage their day-to-day -day work behind it all. So we do a little bit of everything as it relates to small business ownership and entrepreneurship. Love it. And why should me and Steven be jealous that you get to work at GoDaddy? Well, I could talk about this question all day because I think <laughs> I just... I just uh, uh, pointed to it a little bit, but I, I came to GoDaddy because of that chance to have that macro impact on our world, right? And something that resonates with me is uh, there's a Harvard Business School professor, Professor Howard Stevenson. I'm, I'm not sure if you're familiar, but he famously defined entrepreneurship as, quote unquote, the pursuit of opportunity beyond resources controlled. And I thought that was such, it was both an accurate description of entrepreneurship, but also a really interesting one when we consider it through the lens of empowering communities, right? the pursuit of opportunity beyond resources controlled. So if we can, I think about that in, in, in the way that if we can truly empower small business owners and entrepreneurs to succeed, think about what we can unlock, right? Generational wealth, community growth, social advancement, equitable opportunities, all kinds of like macro impacts that we're really looking to, to have. In fact, we have a, a, a group in our organization, the Venture Forward team who conducts and publishes research on, on micro businesses. And they found that micro business owners of color are more likely to start their businesses in order to support their communities. And it's, it's so interesting because like that makes so much sense, right? And the fastest growing segment of micro business owners since the start of the pandemic have been black women. So what an opportunity to focus on creating more equity in our society, like combating racial and other wealth gaps, building representation across industries and just generally making people's lives better. So I don't know if that doesn't get you interested. I don't know what will personally. <laughs> Now I'm fired up. I'm definitely interested and love love what uh, what you're doing and the work that GoDaddy's doing in the space and just in a general sense. 
you know, diversity is hard. <laughs> and I say this coming from uh, most people don't know that part of my career journey was, uh, well, uh, I'm Latinx. And so I most often relate to the topic of diversity, inclusion, and belonging from that lens, operating as a, as a Latino and the challenges that have, have come with that and the opportunities, honestly. I also am a former diversity practitioner, <laughs> which is the part that most people don't know. And somewhere along the line in my corporate HR, I, I was pulled into ERGs and then I, I moved to a subsidiary of the company that I was working for and was asked to take on, um, as part of my responsibilities in HR, diversity and inclusion is, is what we called it. And, uh, and so having, having worked at operationalizing diversity and inclusion at a real estate and finance company in Dallas, Texas, I, I quickly learned how challenging this work is. And, and I think it's challenging anywhere by any dimension. The one thing I will say, though, is I think most people get on board with the business case for DEIB. I also believe that it's a extremely polarizing topic. And because of that, most organizations are struggling to move the needle, particularly in, in today's kind of workplace. And so I'm curious, what are some of the biggest blockers to making progress today? Like my experience was 10 years ago in real estate and finance, the world was a very different place. So today, given the work you do, you're in the day-to-day -day combat every single day. You know, what are... What are the blockers that you're seeing to, to getting this work right? I appreciate this question. And, and to your point, 10 years ago, you might have been talking more about the business case then, right? That might have been the blocker for you is just yeah. convincing people of the value. But now there's so much research that just shows that it just it, it makes so much sense in every way, right? So beyond that, where are we now and what are the blockers? I, I'd say the biggest one in my mind, and it's not one that you probably hear a whole lot of folks talk about, but it's one that I personally feel like we need to talk more about, is capacity. And not mm. just capacity for this work, right? But more importantly, everyone's capacity at the organization. DIB priorities and goals will never succeed if companies don't shift the way that they actually plan people's work and like expect the outcomes from that work, right? So how, how can we, the question I have around this and that I continually ask myself is how can we expect to make progress if we're not deliberately creating space and time for people to engage inclusively, to learn effectively and to grow? A good example is which one do we think would have a better outcome? Let's bring together a team who doesn't really know each other at all, right? They don't really know how they all like to work. They haven't really set out any good communication norms. And then we ask them to go, go, go and create a deliverable immediately. Okay, that might work. We'll get something out of that, right? But let's let's think about the alternative. The alternative is bringing together a team and specifically building time in their, in their project schedule for them to get to know each other, to test out approaches to work, to experiment with different types of communication, and to actually build that more trusting rapport, right? Which do we think, which team do we think will create the better work and the better outcome there? The latter, no doubt about it. No doubt about it, right? And I'm, I'm not sure if the two of you and, and others are familiar with uh, the Tuckman model, but it essentially details how teams can go through different phases as they, they begin working together. And it, it shifts from forming to storming to norming and performing. So it essentially means that like, we can't expect the team to immediately just start performing, right? There are steps that come before that. And those steps require time, energy, and investment. And I will pile on like just selfishly, those are the steps, those pre-steps of the forming and storming are actually where it's best to apply DEIB best practices and principles, like staying compassionate, curious, and courageous in how we engage with each other, right? So if we're just skipping over those steps all the time, now I'm, my work's going to have very limited impact. And this is especially true of more diverse teams, where while diversity has such value, it also takes a little bit of effort for us to like really figure out how to leverage it because we're all coming at things from different perspectives and that's the beauty of it. But it means that we need to take time to do that. So I, I think appropriate team staffing is just so important in, in, the, in that like kind of project capacity. But then also when we're thinking about giving people time to engage with the, the other things that we're offering, like company culture events, right? Employee resource groups, 
learning and development opportunities. If people aren't actually showing up to any of this, it doesn't matter what we put out there. So I'd say everything that I'm doing as a DEIB professional will have a limited impact if our companies and our leaders don't give people time to even engage with it. So capacity and, and time are the, the biggest blockers that I see in this work. Yeah. And I, I, we had, we had the, the great fortune to have Mita Malik on our show in the early mm-hmm. days of the modern people leader. And one of the things that she mentioned that just kind of hit home like immediately was that many times those that are chosen to do this work, diversity, inclusion, equity, and belonging type work are, are the, are from underrepresented groups and Mm -hmm. they represent the minority at these companies, but yet they're being asked to do so many things in addition to right. their day job, and it can be a beatdown because you're not getting paid extra money for this. You are you are trying to champion something that's in that's in the company's admitting like this is an issue. We need it. We need to change. We want to change this, right. and yet I'm compounding the issue by stretching you, Stephen, our token Latino. I'm stretching you thin because you're mm-hmm. going to be in every photo shoot. You're going to be the diverse interviewer and all the executive interviewer. And, and like when she framed it that way, it, it added another layer of depth to this blocker. I'm glad, I'm glad we haven't talked about this and I'm, I'm glad you, you, you've raised it or kind of flagged it. And, and that, that immediately, that's what I, I, I went back to what Mia shared with us two years ago. Yeah, there's this concept of emotional burden on those who are already marginalized. And sometimes people call it something like the inclusion tax. But the when we're doing the work tax. at <laughs> right? when we're I doing the work that. at uh at at GoDaddy, we um we just we generally try to check ourselves on that all the time, right? So who are we asking to solve the problems? If it's the folks who are suffering from those problems, then we have it wrong. And we need to take a, a fresh look at the way that we're approaching it. So I want to talk about hybrid work. So we had an episode, we had a group episode. I don't know, I'm losing track of time. It must have been like six, seven months ago. And we had a few people on, we talked about the impact of hybrid work on DEI. And at the time, I feel like the conclusion that we came to is like, I don't know, like, we we don't really know what the impact is yet. But I'd say that, you know, half of the people that we talked to in the Modern People Leader, their companies are either fully remote, and the other 50% are hybrid. But for the 50% that are hybrid, they all define it like a bit differently. Some are fully flexible or like give, you know, the choice to their employee. And then some uh, have people come in a set number of days a week. But I guess the one commonality between all of those in a hybrid setup is that they were all 100% remote during COVID, a time in which it felt like we made great strides on the DEIB front. So I guess my question for you is, do you do you have any concerns with with hybrid work and the potential to undo some of the progress that we've made? The short answer is yes, Daniel, I do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a much longer answer behind that. And this may be in part because I'm a Scorpio, so I have a tendency to always be looking out for the the concerns and the and the risks and the challenges, but it's actually part of my job. So well, first, to your point, is hybrid work is here to stay, right? So I'm so excited and appreciative that we're really starting to talk about about it as a concept and, and really thinking about the way that it affects the way that we work and the way that it affects our employee experience. I think it's also important to acknowledge that hybrid, remote, and flexible work has been absolutely invaluable for so many marginalized and underrepresented employees across industries, right? There's, we can talk about this research all day, but there's so much research that has shown that it's been a true driver of, of equity between groups in ways that we, we really struggled to make progress on before. It can increase productivity. It can increase feelings of inclusion and belonging. And to add some icing on the cake, it decreases emissions and the strain on our planet, right? So there's a lot of great things about hybrid and remote and flexible work that I'm just, I'm so glad that as a society, this has been the outcome of the pandemic for us is is really making those realizations of the the benefits. On the flip side, however, (laughs) there are some real risks that companies and leaders, I think, really need to be, to stay aware of and to be deliberate about just assessing on an ongoing basis. Because to your point, they, they do have 
potential to undo some of those recent gains in inclusion and equity, equity specifically for marginalized and underrepresented people. I think that the two biggest risks are flexibility and proximity biases, as we like to call it, right? So that's essentially to say leaders might unconsciously assume that the people who they can physically see in the office are working harder or more committed or showing up and are actually creating better outcomes than those who are not physically there, right? So while it's it's unconscious biases around performance, commitment, and engagement are always a threat, I think they're becoming an increasing threat when we layer on top the proximity bias and the flexibility bias, if, if that makes sense. And obviously that compounds too, if these are folks from marginalized backgrounds who are the ones who have a tendency to be the ones who are working from home, who are working in flex flexible work and engagements, et cetera. Another risk is segregation because what we don't want to happen is that we have this great diverse workforce, but they never actually are, are physically together and they never actually get to engage with each other. They never get to see each other in the hallways. They never get to run into each other and have water cooler talk. All that really are kind of organic benefit from having a diverse employee base can be lost when you have to actually deliberately engage with people versus just having all of those people in one space. And it could really undercut all of those efforts that we've made around leveraging diversity for things like learning and development and growth and just exposure <laughs> to, to other backgrounds and identities that may be different from, from your own. And then, you know, I, I always think about exclusion right? You might remember what it was like to try to call in into a conference room full of people when you were remote and they weren't. I don't, I don't know if the two of you have had that experience, but I, oh, I had Daniel it. does. <laughs> Daniel. Oh, geez. Thinking back to that lovely experience of desperately trying to get a word in when there's a group of 20 people sitting around a table. And even if you're the subject matter expert, your voice is going to get drowned out, right? While you're on the phone or you're on the Zoom. So that's, it's it's going to be something that we really need to to look at deeply and ensure that we're able to kind of track the effects of. And it's not just project work either, right? Like ERG events and and other kinds of cultural events that we run. I think companies, including ours, have been trying out all different ways to kind of approach those to make sure that people feel like they're having a great time and they're connecting with each other. But there's only so much that we can do. And all of this, of course, inevitably will have a greater impact on those who are already marginalized or who are already having tough experiences at work, right? So it's the compounding nature of those risks that really kind of keeps me up at night. So for, for the people that are listening that work for a company that is hybrid and uh, that's, that's a decision that's not going to change, like what can they do to sort of like mitigate the amount of proximity bias or flexibility bias like, are there some things that they can think about doing in addition to, you know, whenever somebody's calling in remotely for everyone having their camera on, like, what are some other tips that you would give those, those uh, leaders? Yeah, I appreciate you asking. And outside of the general best practices, like make sure you have good technology to enable all of this, right? The, the data geek in me wants to point to the fact that there's actually some data that we can start tracking around this if possible. So businesses could consider tracking data like promotions and attrition against frequency in the office. So for the people who are coming in the office, what's their promotion rate versus the people who are not coming into the office, for example. That might actually admittedly be a difficult metric to, to get to, just knowing, knowing a lot about how data flows in, in corporate systems. But another kind of alternative approach is what we do at GoDaddy, which is having something like a promotion flagging process in place where we proactively identify potentially eligible employees who should receive like a review for promotion consideration rather than relying on subjective criteria and identification. So even if you're having, even if you're suffering from unconscious biases in some way, this process overrides that by saying, oh, you're up for review for promotion, right? It, it, it will ping the managers to make sure that they're considering people on an ongoing rolling basis rather than leaving it to the managers to identify folks based on their own feelings on, on what's been happening on the team, for example. Other than that, I just say we're really trying to be particularly thoughtful about these risks when building out training and other resources for leaders and managers. So things like creating best practice guides and tangible action plans for team leaders to help mitigate these risks. It's the more that we can actually point to the risks and name them, then the more that we're creating awareness around them, and then the more that the the other kind of general best best practices um, that we're rolling out will actually be applied to these in a way that wouldn't if we weren't having the conversations around it. 
So in addition to everything that you just talked about, you know, ways of mitigating some of those biases, I know that at GoDaddy, y'all are focusing on process-driven initiatives. So I was I was just taking a look at some of the notes that you had sent over, and you were talking about how y'all have gone through the process of reevaluating things like your performance management process, the you know end in recruiting process. Uh, can you can you tell us about some of that work? Sure. And this is where, this is what you get when you hire a DIB professional with a strategy and operations background, right? I'm going to come in, I'm going to talk about process maps. I'm going to ask us to look at the whole end-to-end -end process. But seriously, like, I, I, I truly, and I truly believe that we'll only ever get so far by only focusing on changing behaviors, because in the end, people follow steps that they're told to follow, right? And, and, and the workflows that are built for them actually dictate what their actions are. So if those processes are inherently inequitable themselves, then the process itself needs to change. We don't need to change, like not necessarily the hearts and minds following it. Um, don't get me wrong. We should still change hearts and minds, but it's only going to have that limited impact if we don't also focus on process. So good example, let's take hiring. Right. If hiring managers are told specifically to assess candidates on behaviors that are more stereotypically associated with men, for example, no matter how much we train those hiring managers on unconscious biases, they'll continually follow that inherently biased process because that's what they've been told to do. And I, I think about this, too, in the way that I feel like as a society, we've made great progress in understanding how inequities are actually systemic. And we should really be having those same types of conversations in business. So at GoDaddy, we've taken some really deep looks, like you said, Daniel, into some of our, our processes like performance assessment, promotions, recruitment. And the way that I go about it is to kind of just, you know, let's take recruitment, for example, because I'm going through this process with our, our lovely talent acquisition team right now. I sat them down and said, all right, walk me through the end-to-end -end recruitment lifecycle. Let's start all the way at the beginning with strategy and planning. Then we'll go through to sourcing and then screening and then hiring and then onboarding, right? And really just truly creating a process map of that entire life cycle from start to finish. And it's important while doing that to really flag what's happening, who's doing it, when it's happening, and how it's being done. And then the next pass over that map can be, okay, we have our recruitment cycle down. What are all the inclusive recruitment best practices that we know that we could apply? And going through that and saying, what do we do today versus where are there opportunities? And that, that essentially allows us to create this really robust gap analysis. What do we do today? What are opportunities to do more? Where do we need more, let's say, governance or standardization, for example, and what are we going to do about it? Then we can pull all that out, put it in a little to-do list, right? Assign owners, prioritize it, size it, et cetera. And there you go. You have your backlog of all of the work that you want to get done to, to create a truly equitable and inclusive recruitment process. What, what I really like, Chrissy, about the, the example you just shared is that you are using normal speak and jargon, business <laughs> jargon. Right. You are not using DEIB speak and jargon. And and the reason why I think that is important because I I personally believe that diversity work, just to simplify, <laughs> so I don't keep saying an, an, an acronym, the work that you do, that we do in this space, it's ultimately a business practice, right? Mm -hmm. It is a fundamental aspect of the way the business operates. And so I always kind of cringe when things are being repurposed or rebranded or repositioned because I feel like we're creating unnecessary barriers for for colleagues and 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 people that want to get involved to get involved, right? And so I love I love the this whole process lens and in, 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 in how you're doing this. But if we can kind of double click on this a little bit and or or actually zoom out. And if you could walk us through like how do you even you're at a new organization or you're you're this is fresh, this is day 91 at GoDaddy, right? Mm -hmm. You've you've been onboarded, you've you've listened, you've taken in information. How do you start to, there are a lot of business processes. How do you determine where you start? Did you do like a top down? Did you align it with kind of the goals of diversity, equity, and inclusion? Are you looking at survey data? Like, mm -hmm. I, I would love if you're comfortable, if you could just share a little bit about, okay, you know, this is how you can take this type of approach. Um, but, you know, 
from the beginning. No, absolutely. I And again, another thing I could talk about all day, obviously, because this is what I'm passionate about. And to your point, Stephen, I think the it's very strategic, this approach, right? It's meant to actually normalize it as a, a, any other business process. If we're going to, if we're going to prioritize things like, uh, you know, developing a new product, which, let's prioritize this in the same way and let's go through the process in the exact same way. So the first thing, first step is to actually understand how we operate as a business. When I come in, when I first came into GoDaddy, I took some time, not only meeting people, but asking them about the ways that we actually assess opportunities and the way that we prioritize and to your earlier word, right? How are we, how do we operationalize things? Because then that gives me the vocabulary and it gives me the ability to, to ask the right questions and to start actually driving that process itself in the same way that we do any other process, any other business process. So we really get to that normalization. And then to your other point, as you can imagine, I had my hands in every little piece of data that I could possibly get. <laughs> so, um, and that, that's not just in, that's not just employee data, right? I, I'm looking at all kinds of data and, I actually start with this map that I have that I, I, I'd happily share, but it essentially maps just about every business process that we have across our employee experience, business operations, and customer experience. And that includes everything from things that you might not even expect, mergers and acquisitions, right? There's, there's There are equity opportunities in the way that we approach mer mergers and acquisitions. There are obviously equity opportunities in the way that we approach training for employees or benefits for employees, right? Processes, policies, et cetera. There are also equitable opportunities in things like the way that we design and build our products and our technology for our customers, the way that we engage with our customers, the types of products that we're putting out in market for our customers. So in some ways I take the most holistic view you could possibly imagine. And that's where I start. And I say, all right, <laughs> let me see how I could collect information around where we are today across all of these different areas. And then as I'm collecting that information, whether it be data, like qualitative data or quantitative data, or really just doing deep dives with the leaders and the managers of those areas, it starts creating a very organic high level gap analysis. So I start jotting down strengths and opportunities across all of these different areas. What are the strengths? What are the opportunities? And as you start doing this and building this over time, it essentially becomes its own heat map. You start seeing the, where all the red is versus where all the green is. And then that allows you to really kind of take that step back and prioritize. Um, and, you know, with with the diversity work or the DEIB work, there's always going to be some deep priorities that we need to make on the employee experience side. But we should never let ourselves fully get distracted by just that because there's so much more um, that can, you know, so, there's so much more that we can create value around across the way that we work. And if we do that, then we are truly normalizing in a way that it doesn't feel like we're constantly making progress with employee experience, but undoing that progress by not actually infusing the same principles and approaches more broadly across the business. And so I'm thinking about the heat map. I'm, th I'm thinking about the analysis, the mappings, the flows, all of it. And I'm, I'm geeking out because I, I love this <laughs> stuff also. So I want to... I'm going to take us off script a little bit. You know, we're we're deep into the conversation now and there's there's really been something on my mind, geez, for the last 6 months, um maybe a little longer. You know, we we have a a really unique vantage point at the Modern People Leader that was unexpected and honestly unintended in that because we're meeting with people leaders and senior people leaders and because People leaders have the entire usually have the entire vantage point of the the entire company, right? Because what we do touches the most important asset of the business, right? right. It's the people that are are doing creating the widgets, coding the product, you know, whatever 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 industry you're in, it is it's arguable that the people are the most important most important part of of making it all work, and. And so we, we're hearing these things, we're hearing trends, we're hearing issues, we're hearing blockers, and I, I still haven't fully crystallized this kind of theory, but I'm going to call it the great pause. I can't think of another better way of referring to it. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we are coming out of a period of so much disruption in the workplace so many radical views. It's, it's been awesome. Like I've, I've loved it, right? All of these things that we've always wanted to see and test and try. And 
this big issue is getting in the way. The economy, the, you know, and, and it, it's not just the economy, just kind of the state of, of global business right now. It's troubled, right? right? I think it's safe to say that we will all agree that it's troubled. And and that's why I'm calling it the great pause. Well, first we haven't had a, the great something like it's sudden all that suddenly disappeared when there wasn't a new a new HR thing, but I'm calling it the great pause because all these wonderful things that have been happening, I fear I hope I'm wrong, but I, I fear they're going to be put on pause or on the back burner, and we're entering a a, a critical period where whatever emerges as the right the right approach or the right disruption is going to shake out. But unfortunately, some of the things that have popped up are my fear is they may go away. And so if I'm in this space and if I am in this environment of budgets are getting paused or they're getting hacked or they're disappearing, headcount also disappearing, things are, I believe, in the early stages of getting really, really challenging for every aspect of the business. And so for these emerging kind of trends, these emerging practices, there, there are some that are so near and dear to me that we've got to find a way to continue making progress. And the, the DEIB work for me falls in that space. Like we finally got the focus that we needed to get on the topic. We finally, you know, there was a, a perceived commitment by companies to really take action and do things differently or make material investments. And so the big risk is that a lot of these things start to get put on hold or, and, and it's not even spoken, right? The way it works is like, oh, well, yeah, we're not going to have budget for that. And, oh, we're going to have to get back to you. Time goes on. Next thing you know, a year goes by. <clears throat> and so my question for you is for your peers out there, that are passionate about this work, what can we do to protect the progress that we've made in, in, in a healthy way, right? And, you know, what are some of the things that, you know, that we can be doing to make sure that this just doesn't fall by the wayside? Well, it's a timely question. I don't know if you know this, Stephen, but we actually, GoDaddy just launched a blog series and the first blog post was actually about how leaders could prioritize DEIB during economic uncertainty. <laughs> so it's no, I didn't know. I it's swear. literally time. <laughs> and so in, in that, in that post, I, I, I talk a lot about some of the things that we talked about today, honestly, which is treating it like an everyday business thing and doing it in the small integrated ways that just build out of process. Right. So it doesn't take $300,000 to look at your recruitment workflows end to end. It takes a couple people in a room who know how to do the work and them having a conversation and then talking to their leader about the next steps, right? There's so much preceding of what we could do when, for example, economic uncertainty gets a little bit more certain in the future, where we can be ready to go and move a lot faster if we do a lot of that kind of process-oriented work today and have those conversations. And it also, to your point, allows us to hone in on the areas where we need to sustain right? Sustaining is so important in this work for all the reasons that, that you mentioned. There's also an aspect of, I didn't quite name it this way in the blog, but it's something I, I joke around uh, internally with our folks about. I call it sneaky DEIB, right? It's like, where, where, are, we, <laughs> where are we kind of like stealthily introducing topics or, you know, building things into existing, existing trainings or systems or conversations where it doesn't feel like a net new, big, scary thing, it's just something that is there as part of something else, right? So example is you don't need to build out an enormous inclusive leadership training program to train on inclusive leadership principles. Um, mm -hmm. Every company has, well, uh, most major companies have some semblance of leadership training, right? Mm -hmm. Take a moment to refresh that training with some DEIB best practices and just infuse it in there. There's so many different ways that we can do that. Another thing too, is I, I think, um, Companies sometimes get a little stuck on what's the big optically exciting thing that we could do around something versus something that might be free and easy, <laughs> for example. So we have we work with all kinds of partners that give us potentially free resources to use in-house. A good example is an employee employee assistance programs. They they employ all kinds of amazing experts, psychologists, doctors, mental health folks. 
we can tap these resources under existing contracts and bring those people in to our to our company to continue the work around conversations and around training around tools and resources without necessarily have to like having to put a whole lot more into it outside of what we already have and then lastly i think this is this is an important point that i make at the end of that blog post which is to say DEIB professionals in particular, but all leaders really need to make sure that we're not compromising on the most important things for our people. Because Stephen, I have to say, I haven't heard many people actually state it the way you did. And I so appreciate it because I, I, I say things very similarly, which is businesses need to understand that their people are their best asset. I don't think that that is arguable. <laughs> I think it is just <laughs> bad. Guys, what are we? Yeah. <laughs> Who does the work if not the people, right? The people literally, even if it's code, if people are writing the code, they are managing the code, they are fixing the code. So um, at GoDaddy, we have the saying of being human first. And I take that really deeply to heart. So even when we're talking about things like budget and potentially constraints, I, I, I always try to keep it for, like top of mind that nobody should have to feel unvalued or not included or discriminated against because of a budget cut. We need to fight for the most important things for our people to make sure that they can feel like they can actually get their work done and be successful. Because otherwise, what on earth are we doing <laughs> if we're not doing that? Totally agree. Totally agree. If I'm, if I'm right, and I, I hope I'm not, what are some of the, you know, what are some of the things you think might be at risk? Some of the progress that that may be at risk, and, and it doesn't even have to be, be DEIB related. Just like I'm just curious because you have you seem to have a a lot of uh, a clear a clarity on the response to my last question. So, what keeps you up at night at things that might be at risk out there? Mm. I think, from a more macro perspective, I'd say. I don't know that we always recognize the weight that current events really play a role in the way that we feel as people and as humans, right? And, you know, I, I joked about, you know, us living in this age of information, but let's think about what has changed since the 1980s when the internet really started coming about, where things were happening on the other side of the world. And we might have heard about it through a newspaper after a couple of weeks or something, right? But it wasn't something that was so in our face. Um, and there are pros and cons to that. Don't get me wrong. I'm all about learning and, and awareness and, and education. And I, I think that really is the way to change the world. But the, the risk that comes with this, like, you know, access to all of the information of what's happening is that we can't get away from it. And it's weighty. And even if it doesn't directly influence us in that day, for example, we don't, I don't think we've given enough consideration to how it sits in the back of our mind. And then when you think about that from a, a workplace perspective, if our folks are sitting there with all these things in the back of their minds that are, that are really heavy, how is that affecting their ability to show up at work and how they feel at work? That's a, that's a macro thing. I think a more micro thing, not to say that it's not as important, but just in terms of it being more directly specific to business is, of course, representation. We made a lot of gains over the years, as you know, um, in our focus on representation, but with limited hiring, with attrition, with just people really starting to rethink what they're doing in their lives and, and reconsidering their careers. I think companies really need to be very protective. If we can't make gains right now, we should at least be protective around making sure that we have talent of all different backgrounds and identities sticking with us. And that, that gets to us making sure that they feel valued and that they can belong so that we can, they want to stay with us. Oh, that's great stuff. And I didn't even get to ask about AI and the impact to, to yeah. DEIB. It's but a whole other conversation, we'll to, Stephen. <laughs> we'll have to bring you back. We're going to have to bring you back. I hope you've enjoyed this conversation because I already want you to come back and, and have another, another follow-up. But before we get to any of that, it's time to enter what we call the rapid fire question section right. of the, uh, the conversation. Same set of questions. We ask every guest, minor modifications over time. First question for you. How do you define a modern people leader? What are the traits and characteristics? I think about this all the time. So this is an easy answer for me. Uh, it's someone who leads with compassion, curiosity, and courage in all things, all the time. And that includes mm -hmm. being vulnerable, accountable, empathetic, thoughtful, humble, and an ally to all, essentially. Love it. Plus one of all of that. Um, next question. If you could go back in time and talk to a 22-year-old you, what career advice would you give yourself and why? Oh, I really don't want to picture a 22-year-old me, but you're making me do it, Stephen, so I'll do it. Um, <laughs> this is a, a bit more on the personal side, but I'd say I tell myself to stop worrying. 
that mm. even though I am who I am and I didn't come from much, I will be recognized for my value. Uh, so be confident, keep moving. You are recognized. <laughs> Thank I, you. I'm, I'm recognizing <laughs> you for killing this conversation today because this has been so much fun. Next question. Do you have any shout outs you want to give to any members of the Go your GoDaddy team or just anyone at GoDaddy in general? This is this is your time to uh, to shower praise on all the great people that you work with. Oh, this might be the hardest question because there's so many. Um, as you can imagine, everything I do in my work is cross-functional. So I have the pleasure of joining forces, which is one of our GoDaddy values, uh, with a ton of spectacular people, right? So there are too many to name and none is more important than the next. Um, but uh, specifically, I, you know, I, I really want to call out all the people who work on our ERGs, including our members and our leaders and our sponsors, our learning and development team, our human resources team, and our human resources business partners, our legal team. But honestly, even just every single individual employee who contributes their voice with passion and courage to help us continually think about how we build and maintain a great community and provide excellent customer service. Love Boom. It. Mic drop. Um, all right. One, one last question before we get to, uh, to one word closes. Is there, is, is there anybody in the HR or DEI space or could be a CEO, like anybody that, that you had that's on your radar where you're like, I want to talk to that person. Like I want 30 minutes of their time to learn from them. And if so, like, who is that person? Because we want to bring them onto the show. Hmm. I'm not sure. I, when thinking about this question, I kept coming back to people who I work with, to be honest, because I, I learned so much from the folks who I, I engage with directly, right? And our own leaders. And yeah. um, what I learned from them is is how leadership should and could appear in our specific community. I would suggest you reach out to somebody named Demetria Elmore, who is our leader, um, is a leader in our care and services organization. And she also happens to be an executive sponsor of one of our ERGs. And she honestly is just, she's one of these leaders who knows how to truly show up for her people. And I want to clone that. <laughs> and this is like replicated across the world, right? Um, and she really leads by example and has a great impact on our GoDaddy community. Um, and I suspect on our, you know, on the broader community of all of the customers with whom she interfaces every day. So I'm going to, I'm going to give you a, a bit of a, a strange response to it by saying it's one of my colleagues. I'd love for you to chat with Dimitri Elmore. We're going to reach out to Dimitri. All right, so one word or phrase close. We all respond to the word or phrase from the episode that we want to close with. And who wants to get us get us started? I'd like to hear Stephen if you're willing to, to go first. I'm gonna go with I'm gonna go with recognize. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's a powerful word, especially yeah. in the context of the conversation we're having. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of powerful, I'm going to go with Empower, which is also the aptly named program that actually attracted me to come and join GoDaddy. We didn't get to talk too much about today, but um, that that sense of empowerment is just so important in the work that I do, and I, I use it constantly. I'm going to say the great pause. Um, <laughs> every once in a while, so usually most of the you know clips that we're creating from the episode are from our, our guest, and very rarely will we create clips for, for Steven or I, but I was like, all right, Steven, like you're bringing the heat today. I, that's a clip. <laughs> I even wrote that yeah. in the doc. So I don't know what, what's in my water today, but I'm, I I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it. Love it. Can I add one more bonus word? Just, sure. just cause I, my, my bonus word is fun. This has really been a fun and enjoyable conversation. And so thank you, Christy, for joining us today. It's been an absolute blast. Like I mentioned earlier, we have ton, a ton of guests who have come back and blessed us by joining us on, an, on, a, on a group session or just a follow-up conversation. And we would love to bring you back if you're interested. But most, most importantly, this has been so much fun and, and we're really grateful uh, that you, you agreed to join us. Likewise, thank you so much for having me. And what a great way to just end out the week <laughs> on a Friday afternoon yes. for me over here in Boston. Yes. So. All right, guys, have a great weekend, and we'll all talk soon. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye.